everybody, it's Kelly. Uh, another time for Coffee with Kelly. Um, I wanted to make this video because I wanted to show people um, how I went about testing for cerebral spinal fluid coming out of my nose in an unconventional way when nobody would really believe me. So this is for people out there who are going through this same process right now where they believe that they have uh, brain fluid coming from their nose, through their ears, through their eyes, when you have a cranial leak, a spontaneous cranial leak, um, and how I went about uh, convincing a doctor to finally get some real results and real tests going. Um, the, the golden egg test for this is called the beta-2 transferum test. Now that's if you can actually get a cup of fluid, you know, enough. You really don't need that much, but in the hospital they ask you for a little more. You need like a tenth of a teaspoon. So that's really not too much, but they, you know, I had to do 10 milliliters, which was like half of that. Um, but there are some people that leak intermittently, or there are some people that leak at night, or only when they bend over, because it depends on how big the hole is, where the hole is located in the skull of your, you know, of your head. Um, you know, I just happen to be a lucky one that just leaks like crazy. So what I did is, um, let me give you a little story first. Sorry, I have to keep this in because otherwise it'll just go down my shirt and it's, it's just part of my life right now. So usually, you know, when you have this problem, your best friends are, you know, Kleenex and, uh, of course, sanitizing for your hands. And when you go out, outside mask because especially when you have a leak you want to prevent yourself from getting any kind of cold virus or anything which can cause meningitis which is could be lethal so you want to avoid all of that at all costs until you get your diagnosis and your surgery and you get all patched up so um, the way it happened for me was uh, I've been having bouts of what's called Bell's palsy now, um, first of all, get yourself a good book. Here's a great book here. This book, it's an anatomy book by um, Dr. Peter Abrams. He's, this is an award-winning book. He's uh, an award-winning autonomist, anonymous, uh, anatomist, anatomist. Um, and, you know, he's a professor, a professor at the University of Cambridge and a professor at St. George University. Um, and this book, the reason why I'm using it, I have various books here at home, and that's why I was so lucky to be able to figure out a way to test my um, fluid coming out of my nose, because I remember reading some of the medical journals that I have on my path that I'm studying to be a naturopathic doctor. So I remembered that cerebral spinal fluid has contains glucose, and normal mucus does not. Normal mucus has a very, very low level of mucus, which would be like 10 milligrams or less. Um, spiral spinal fluid normally is in between 50 to 80 milligrams. Uh, now, this isn't like the chosen test that you should do, but this is something that will get your doctor's attention. Because if it's not cerebral spinal fluid, your glucose test will not be positive. It'll be very low or negative. So if you, you know, have clear, watery liquid coming from your nose, like tears, no mucus, no blood, this is the test for you to do. Um, now if there's blood coming out of there because you had a cranial injury or some kind of a trauma, this test might not be the best for you because... If there's blood mixed into the mucus that's coming out of your nose, it would give you a false positive, um, and you'd really want to have that tested for beta-2 transfer. Um, luckily for me, mine is only clear, and uh, they kept diagnosing me with chronic sinusitis, and, you know, the only symptom that I had was the clear water running out of my nose. I had no other symptoms of sinusitis, so that put on my antennas right away saying, you know, that's not the case because when you have sinusitis, you have like pain here or pain here. Um, 
you have, you know, uh, sneezing, coughing, you'll have like yellow or green mucus discharge if you have an infection, you know, um, basically with a CFF leak, tremendous migraines. They're just beyond word migraines because the intracranial pressure in your head um, just like pushes it down. So what is happening there, you know, intracranial pressure is not the same thing as blood pressure. So you could have a high intracranial pressure in your head because that depends on how much uh, CFF's fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid that's being made by the, the um, chorae plexus, which is a, you know, a gland that's like one of the first things that is made when we are born. That's like the tree of life, you know, that's the, the fluid that goes through our brain, down our spinal cord, and protects, you know, all of our nervous system. So that's like one of the first organs, I want to say, that is made when a human is being conceived. So that being said, it, it, it produces up here. If you produce too much, it can cause intracranial hypertension. Or there's other things that could go on that could give you a CS. You could have a tumor, you could have an autoimmune disease. Um, Dr. Shrevink, he is one of the leading neurosurgeons that deals with uh, skull base uh, and CFF leaks, um, has written reports that are in the National Center for Biotechnology Information and the National Library of Medicine, so you can look this up, that most spontaneous cranial leaks or spinal leaks of um, cerebral spinal fluid are a, a heritable disorder of connective tissue. So it's genetic heterogeneity. It's, it's a genetic thing. It's something that you already have that makes your connective tissue not as strong. Uh, the collagen fibers, they break apart easier. So what a CFS leak basically is, if you have this book here, I, I love this book because it's got pictures, so it kind of shows you what's going on. All right, here's a picture here, if you can see, of the brain. And you see there is this tan, this tan here that's called dura matter. That is like a plastic bubble that keeps the brain, the cerebral final fluid here that circulates all through the brain, goes up through here, comes down through the spinal cord, that keeps it intact. Now when you have hypercranial in, um, in hypertension, this will um, get a tear if you have you know increased pressure in your head. Now there's a million reasons why you could have that increased pressure. Like I said, Dr. Shipping, one of the leading neurosurgeons in this field, says that a little less than 100% of cases of these leaks is caused by a genetic tissue disorder. So if somebody else in your family had problems similar to this, or had a stroke, or had terrible migraines, um, that would be something that you'd want to look into because it runs in the family. That being said, um, there's a blood pressure. Your blood pressure is is different than intracranial hypertension than the pressure in your head because your blood is dealing, you know, it's pumping through your heart and uh, it's dealing with the pressure that's coming up and down from your body. Okay, in in the intracranial hypertension. That's dealing with the brain fluid in your head. And when you get too much, you can get hydrocephalus. You've ever seen those stories where the poor children, their head has like uh, swollen to the point where um, it gives them, you know, their brain explodes because they've got all that fluid in there and they have to drain that out. Well, what happened to me was that uh, my body naturally made a drain and it comes right out of my nose. So 
you know, it is what it is, but it saved my life and my body was really smart about doing that. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. Um, so, um, I, you know, the, the thing, one of the things is with this is that as you lose brain fluid, you really lose your memory. You got to think about things a lot. So, you know, don't feel bad. Um, when that happens because you know you can just literally tell them you're losing your mind and that's basically the truth so um my main thing here was to tell you kind of how i got here like i said i used to suffer from from bell's palsy which is like facial paralysis of the seventh cranial nerve and it kind of used to make my face go you know, like that, and it would be like stuck like that for a while. And it's very painful. Um, and you could kind of see that I still have kind of like droopiness on one side, and one side is like like Botoxed, you know, like that. Um, you know, because I've had it ten times, so my face is basically not as symmetrical as it used to be. Um, which is funny because I always got the Bell's palsy on the left side of my face. Now, on the right side of my face is where I got the spinal fluid leak. It comes only on the right side of my nose. But there are problems and consequences of this, especially it depends on where it's leaking from. Mine, they are thinking that is in back in the sphenoid sinus, which is in the middle of the brain, close to the pituitary gland. It's in the same area where your optic nerve is and your carotid artery nerve, your carotid artery. Um, so that affects your vision. And that was one of my first symptoms. When I went to the eye doctor last year, she wanted to dilate my pupils because my vision changed drastically. I've had the same prescription for 35 years. My vision went just like berserk, especially on this side of my face. So you know, she dilated and looked in the optic nerve and she said that she's seen like pressure or fluid in there. So you could have this for quite a while before it actually manifests. And all those times that I was actually having Bell's palsy was actually, I was having one of those intracranial hypertension things. And you know what? They always would help it happen in the middle of the night. Three o'clock in the morning was my like lucky number. I would wake up with my head and I just be like, oh, and I couldn't handle it. It was just so painful. And, and most of the pain would be in the back. Um, in the beginning, would hear in the front. And on Christmas, I finally had one where I, where my face started, you know, doing its Bell's palsy thing, and I'm thinking it's because I was leaking the whole time, and the leak was actually hitting my facial nerves and causing, like, an electric short circuit. So, I mean, that's one of the things that they're going to be looking into when they finish with my MRIs and whatnot. So, um, Christmas Day, 3 o'clock in the morning, I wake up with this tremendous headache that just made me want to throw up because it this is just not like, oh, honey, I have a headache. Give me a Tylenol. This is like, can somebody please take the bulldozer off my head? You can't talk. You can't see. Your ears are going, ee! it sounds like, you know, locusts in July ringing out of your ears. And you can hear, like I was hearing on this side of my head, it was like my, my heart was going boom, 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 boom. It was just like pulsating. And my face was like starting, to, and I'm waking my husband up. I'm like, sweetie, 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 I'm starting to get the, the Bell's palsy again. And usually when we would massage my face, the the um, like the like the spasms would stop. So he gets up and he's massaging my face. Sorry, I got to do a, uh, a switcheroo because that one is like soaked. I mean, I don't want to be gross, but I can literally show you that, look. Can you see that? Okay. You see how much I leaked in just one pad? Look at that. That's just one pad, okay? I must change my pads from my nose, my my packings. Literally, okay, how much you want to say that is right there? It says it's a half of a teaspoon. Okay. A half a teaspoon in one pad. I literally change these a hundred times a day. So uh, that would be about as much as a bottle of water. So when you have a leak, 
drink lots of water because you are going to be dehydrated because your brain is going to reproduce more brain fluid to replace the brain fluid that it's losing and uh, your body's going to be depleted of uh, water in other places and that's what happened to me because I wound up getting kidney stones and gallbladder stones and those were my first entrances to this spinal leak, this um, cerebral leak. Um, as a matter of fact, I was supposed to go and get a kidney stone taken out because kidney stones can be caused by dehydration. Uh, and I was supposed to get it out on the 28th of December, and on Christmas Day, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm having this aneurysm where my, you know, brain explodes and my dura matter, you know, it just tears and the brain fluid starts coming out. So, um, my husband's massaging my face. I can't hear because they're, all I can hear is, and, and you're like, your neck gets stiff and everything hurts. And... All of a sudden, behind here in this area here, this is with me, everybody has it in a different area, but behind here, I heard a pop. Not like a like a pop when you crack your knuckles. It was like a crunch. It was like, like that back here. And all of a sudden, I started dripping. And I thought it was because, you know, like, I was crying or something, and I wasn't even crying because, you know, I didn't even want to cry. The pain was so extensive. And um, my husband went and got me, like, some Tylenol and some water, and we didn't know what was going on. And finally, around 5.30 or so in the morning, I was able to get back to sleep. Now, my whole entire family was really upset with me on Christmas because, you know, everybody wanted to open gifts, and, you know, here I am clunked out in bed because I didn't sleep all night. So... Um, I get up and I'm walking around and I just didn't feel well and I didn't want to cook and I didn't want to eat and I just started throwing up and I didn't know what the problem was. So I went to the emergency room and the emergency room looked at me and, you know, they took my blood pressure and it was a little high and this is where the blood pressure comes in. Normally when you have you know, like, not, you don't necessarily have to have high blood pressure when you have intracranial hypertension. Some people do because they're pretense to having high blood pressure. I never had high blood pressure before prior to this, but I got it afterwards. And my opinion of that is from the extreme pain because every time I was having an attack or one of those migraines, those headaches, my blood pressure would literally glow up to like 220 over 191. It was just like, like, you know, and they tested my heart and gave me a stress test and had me on a heart monitor for four days. It's not my heart. So my blood pressure was going up because of the pain level that I was, you know, my body was in trauma. It was in, it was in stress. And you'd look at me and you can't really see that anything's wrong with me, you know, and they were, one of the doctors told me that I was, uh, I was suffering from hypochondriac psychosis, you know, that there was, it was in my head. And literally, he's right. It was in my head. But, you know, this is something that's just so rare. So I don't really want to diss on any doctors because it doesn't happen to everybody. You know, um, you got to think of it this way. This happens to like one in a hundred thousand people. And that's for like spinal leaks too, because you can, spinal leaks, a lot of people get those from surgery, epidurals, traumas, or something like that. But when you get a spontaneous cranial leak, if you have not had some major trauma where you had like a motorcycle accident or a car accident, or like my one doctor told me that a horse would have had to kick me in the head for that to happen, um, that's, um, it's very rare. It's very rare. And why is it rare? Because it is a genetic tissue disorder that they, you know, that not a lot of people have. So you're thinking about, for spinal leaks, one in 100,000 people. For spontaneous cranial leaks, it's one and a half of this. So if you have a spinal leak, you think you're at a football stadium. It's the Super Bowl. 
in the Super Bowl, it's full. 100,000 people are there, okay? One person out of that whole stadium is going to have what you have. So you can understand how it's a needle in a haystack for the doctors. So this is where you have to be proactive on your own health. You are the one who knows your body. You know what you feel. You know when something is not right. You know when, when they're telling you you have sinusitis or you have a cold and you have no symptoms of that except this horrendous headache and a leaky nose. You know that's not right. So you got to start doing things a little off the cuff. You know, you got to invent. And one of the good things you got to do is go out and get yourself informed. Get an anatomy book. You know, look up in the internet. This tells you all about the brain and all different kinds of things that can happen. Um, after that, another thing you want to do is get yourself a, a folder, a folder like this, and keep all, all, every one of your medical records in there. Everything from CAT scans to discharges from the emergency room, medication that you're taking, because this is a long journey and it's not very easy to get diagnosed. I was very lucky because it leaks out of my nose, like you see, very easily. So I was able to collect this and get the beta transferum test and, and it came out positive. Um, but for me to get to that point, I had to go to three different hospitals or three, three to the hospital three times and have them look at me like I was like the, the lady who needs to be in the crazy bin. So the, the first time I went, I showed up, they gave me a, a CAT scan because I was complaining so much about the headache and, you know, my, my nose was leaking, 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 and I was really worried about that because I felt it pop. I felt like I was going to pass out because you do pass out for a while. I mean, especially I did, especially when you first blow. Um, you, you throw up, you know, and then when you get in there, they give you fluids and then you start feeling a little better because you're dehydrated from losing all of that liquid. So fluids really help. That's why I say, make sure you drink tons of water. I'm talking like eight to 10 of these babies a day. Get yourself some Pedialyte, like the stuff that they give to kids when kids have a fever. They have all different flavors. Drink that. Um, tea, drink green tea. You know, you have to do things the healthy way to help your body. And one of the main things you need to do with a leak is to keep yourself hydrated because otherwise you're going to get other problems. You're gonna get GERD because when you lay down you get the post nasal drip where, it, where the spinal fluid drips down your neck, goes into your stomach, and it's nauseating. It makes you throw up. When you're sleeping, it, it accumulates in your throat. So you got to be very careful not to aspirate that into your lungs because that can cause pneumonia. So, you know, you constantly have to be like spitting it out. Or when you wake up, you're, you're in a coughing fit for about a half hour until your lungs get all of that stuff released. And your, your belly will swell, especially when you're laying down. Because when you're laying down, the leak stops coming out of your nose, and now it's going backwards. So you're, like, drinking it. So your stomach gets so inflamed. So you can notice these things. When you go to the bathroom, I know this sounds kind of weird, but when you go to the bathroom, when you urinate, or when you go number two, it'll have a different smell. Because somewhere, that fluid has to release itself, and it has a different taste. Some people say it tastes metallic. Um, to me, it doesn't taste metallic because I have uh, anemia, so that might be that I don't have enough iron in my blood to taste the metal. That's my opinion. Most people that are in the support group that I'm in, they taste metallic. I taste s sweet and sour, you know, like salty sour. It's just, uh, in the beginning it was more salty. Now it's uh, just kind of sweet, sour, kind of just... It's not a very uh, nice taste. And all through this thing, in the beginning, about three months ago, I could see that I must have had that leak that was just starting to drip because I lost all my taste 
and my sense of smell. I couldn't smell anything anymore. I mean, I couldn't smell like, you know, perfume or what I was cooking. And then when you lose your sense of smell, you lose your sense of taste. So then I couldn't taste anything I was eating. I mean, it was like coffee and, you know, a rock would taste the same to me, you know. And so I just started eating very bland foods because, you know, you... There was, I couldn't even taste garlic. I couldn't taste wasabi. And that's like, you know, so you also have to be really careful what you eat when you have this leak because you don't want to get yourself sick with food poisoning because you'll get that bacteria in your body and you got to really be careful. You got that hole, that opening that you can get meningitis. So stay away from like raw sushi. You know, if you're going to eat sushi, make sure that it's like cooked shrimp or, you know, cooked crab meat. Don't eat anything raw. Make sure that your chicken or whatever is really cooked very well. I stay away from fast food places just because you never know who's ever cooking has a cold or something. You know, you, viruses are very easy to pass, you know. So I'm just kind of on the down low. And when I go out, I put my mask on. You know, I keep it on um, for two reasons. Not to breathe in when anybody else is coughing and for people not to be checking out this, you know, thing I have in my nose. Um, so that happened. Now, after I lost my sense in my smell, then on Christmas, this, you know, the, the brain blew out and I started leaking and I went to the doctor and the first time they gave me a CAT scan, they're like, well, your brain looks pretty good, but we see some aerated secretions in your sphenoid, which is strange because sphenoids are like hollowed out sinuses there shouldn't be any secretions or anything in there so for me that was like a ding 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 note but the doctor said you know you have chronic cytositis they need to get up in there and clean everything out and, um you need to go see you know an ent which is an eye ears nose and throat doctor so uh what did they do the first time they sent me home with a prescription for claritin now, Claritin, if you take this and you're leaking, your nose is leaking, and the Claritin does not stop it because they give you the prescription strength Claritin because it has ephedrine in it or pseudoephedrine. If it does not stop the leaking, then it is not a sinus attack because pseudoephedrine will stop a train in its tracks. Sorry, I'll show you. You see, there's more because I'm going to use that to test it. Oh, you see how it leaks down my nose? Can you see? Yeah, it's constant like that. And I don't really like to taste it on my lips because it's extremely salty. And when it gets in my mouth, you know, it, I feel like it's destroying the enamel of my teeth because it is kind of acidic, I want to say. But my teeth always feel gritty, so I'm always constantly brushing them. It's really gross, especially when it gets in my mouth. Um, so what was I was saying? They gave me Claritin. If Claritin doesn't work and doesn't stop that, because anybody who's had, you know, sinus with a runny nose knows that they take ephedrine, and ephedrine will stop any kind of leakage. If it doesn't stop and keeps going, it's not sinus. If you don't have sneezing and watery eyes and any kind of other sinus symptoms, it's not sinus. If you have a weird taste in your mouth, it's not si it's not sinus. If you um lay down and feel it go down your throat, it's not. Mine leaked so bad when I would sleep on my ear because I would sleep on this side so I could have a uh, like a towel here because it would like leak out of my nose and what I would be you know laying laying back straight up it would like go down my throat so it was like the the worst of two evils do you want to choke on it or do you want to have it like drain on on your pillow so you know that's my two choices to sleep with. so I would sleep on my right side because if I slept on my left side it would like go all the way across my face uh, so I would sleep on this side and you can see my face is puffy because all your sinuses start filling up with the fluid, especially like this side. But they, it fills up with the fluid and gives you these Santa Claus cheeks and makes your nose. You see how my nose is like, 
I don't know. Well, anyway, and you see how my one eye on the right side, look, how it's like puffy and this side is not, you know, probably because I have makeup on. But this side is like, because there's more pressure on that side where the leak is. So I, when I finally got to the doctor after the first time, the second time I went back to the hospital, uh, they sent me, well, I, I had a fever. You see, I came home and like two days later, I had a low grade fever. It was like 99.7, but I didn't feel good. And I was leaking and my, I was shaking. Like my body had the, like the chills and I felt like I was going to pass out and I could not even walk from the couch to the bathroom without somebody holding me because I had no strength because I didn't know that I was leaking out brain fluid, you know, and, and I just wanted to sleep all day. And, uh, I didn't really drink and stuff, you know, I would, and, and then like at two or three in the morning, I'd wake up again with those huge headaches, especially in the beginning. Now I've, I'm like a month in now. So my body has kind of adapted to this leak. It kind of looks at it like it's a natural shunt and it's, and it's kind of adapted and I don't get headaches as much. When I do get a headache, it's because I've been up too long and I leaked out too much, you know, and it sounds gross, but when you leak out, you're losing your fluid. If you're laying down, you're, you're actually consuming your own fluid. So it's recirculating in your body. So that's why you feel better when you lay down. Not only that, you can't move your head fast to the right or to the left or anything because you have such little fluid. Your brain is just like boom, 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 hitting inside your skull. So, yeah, when you turn, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, and you have to grab onto something because you're dizzy. And you don't want to drive like this because, let me tell you, I tried driving and I didn't remember where I was going. And when I got there, I didn't remember what I needed to do. So it's like now everything I like write down. I write everything down. Or, like, I'll talk to Siri in my phone. Hey, Siri, you know, drive me home because I don't know where I'm at. You know, it's not because you're losing your mind. It's just because you're sick and your body is trying to focus itself on something else. You know, and it's not giving you clarity. It's not because, you know, because your production of your fluid is always going to be constant. You just need to drink tons of water to make sure that you're keeping the rest of your organs hydrated. Because, on my case, I wound up getting kidney stones and that, and then from the leakage going into my ear while I was sleeping, um, I, my daughter, an audiologist, because when she looked in my ear, she seen, um, some inflammation and some swelling. And the audiologist told me that I lost the hearing in my right ear. Um, so there are dire consequences on you getting yourself checked up because if you keep leaking and you don't know and you're sleeping on this side, sleeping on that side, and that fluid is going and that fluid is, fluid is burning the hairs the, the, in, inside your ear to make it to where it, it's, it, you're, you're going to lose your hearing. I, you know, I have severe hearing loss in this ear now. And the only way to fix that is to wear a hearing aid. And that's from this leak. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong with that. So the second time I went in, I went in with a fever and one of the nurses there recognized me. So she went to go and talk to the head nurse and kind of ushered me in a little faster. And uh, the doctor came in and asked what was going on. And I'm like, well, I have a fever and I have this fluid looking from my nose and it's a CSF leak. And let me tell you, the second doctor was not having that at all he goes well your cat scan doesn't show anything that's wrong with you and you know you'd have to have a horse hit your head for that to happen and and that's where i did a little investigation because i remembered how cerebral spinal fluid has glucose in it and normal mucus does not so i brought my glucose testing kit that you can use for when you have diabetes or when you got to check your blood pressure your blood sugar um and i was at home and i leaked out some fluid into the cup and you know plugged it in and tested it okay so that's what i want to tell you what i did when i told the doctor about this he said you know no mucus has glucose in it and i was you know i'm sitting there arguing with him saying no it doesn't unless there's blood present and blah 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 
And you can Google this. You can Google cerebral spinal fluid. Does it have glucose versus mucus having glucose? I mean, I have some medical books here that I could like bring out and show you of things that I, you know, read about biology and, and molecular biology and, and how our body works. Um, but if you don't have that or access to that, you can Google it and you can see. Um, you could go to the National Center for Biotechnology Information or the National Library of Medicine, and they will tell you that. Now, it's not always a reliable test to do it that way, because like I said, if you actually have brain trauma or if you're actually having some blood that's mixed in the cerebral spinal fluid, it could give you a false positive. But since mine was just clear liquid pouring out of my nose, I don't see, you know. So what I did was I... Let's get Old Faithful going here so I can drip some more in. All right. I let some drip in here. When you lean forward, it really goes for some reason because it pulls behind your sinuses or your cribriform in your nose. So you, you let it leak in. Um, okay. Oh man. All right. So I got I got enough. You really don't need a lot for a glucose meter because the glucose meter is um you only need a drop. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your strip, stick it in your meter. Okay? Uh, what does it say? Okay. All right. Now it says put it in the fluid. So you put it in the fluid. Okay. So it came out as 90. You see that? 90. Now, if that was mucus, it would either say error or it would be less than 10. The first time I tested it is when it first came out and I was leaking profusely and it was like I was in the acute stage and mine was 130. Now, um, I did a, a testing of my blood actual sugar just to prove to myself that I didn't have any blood coming out of my nose. So then you go and you test your blood sugar. Um, when I did the original test and I did it in front of the doctor and he was amazed and, you know, he left me there for like three hours at this fever and uh, came back three hours later because obviously he went and checked out things on his website or whatever they do and talked with other doctors and he came back in and he's like, well, can you show me that trick of yours where you do it with the glucose meter? And when I showed him, I told him, I said, you know what? I really need you to test this in the laboratory for for spinal fluid because, you know, if I'm wrong and I'm wasting your time, I'll apologize to you. But this is this is my life, you know, and I'm really concerned about things that, you know, happen to me. And, you know, he once he's seen that I tested this, he was uh, kind of different. You know, he was kind of like, oh, so. Let me uh, put another test strip in here, and I'll test my blood. And the reason why I'm testing my blood after I tested the spinal fluid, because you should have a different number. Um, so let's see. All right, here we go. All right. Get some blood going on there. All right, I got some blood coming out of my finger. Test it. Okay, so my blood is 109. You see that? It's not the same. So that's how I got my doctor's attention. I also heard that you can use um glucose strips, you know, they sell them in, in little bottles. 
glucose strips. You can use urine analysis glucose strips, you know, for to check for your glucose in your urine. Not the ketone ones. That's totally different. That's for testing protein. I would look for the ones that are only for glucose, or you can ask your doctor in your doctor's office for it. Um, or if you're lucky enough to have a meter like me, you can leak some in a cup and test it. If you can't leak enough in a cup, literally, when you bend over and you leak a drop on the floor, there's enough in that drop to where you can put it in your meter, stick your meter into that drop, and test it. Okay, if it comes up anywhere between 50 to 80 milligrams or more, because um, it's two-thirds greater than the blood sugar level. My blood sugar right now is kind of weird because I haven't eaten today um, so far, so that's why it's a little bit, you know, weird. Um, but if it was normal mucus, it would be less than 10. So it would have said 10. Mine says 90, so obviously, bing, 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 it's got tons of sugar in it. Um, so that's how I did that. Uh, the, the only thing I could tell you is uh, after you do that, you see if you can get that beta transferum uh, test. If you don't leak enough, or if it goes through the back of your throat, or if it comes out of your ear, there are other options available where they could place pledgets, which are tiny little pieces of like litmus type of paper or cotton. They could place them into your nose, into your ear, um, and they leave them there for 24, 48 hours, and then you will send them to the laboratory and they will test the pledgets for the beta 2 transferum. Once you have the beta 2 transferum verification, then you start along the long lines of getting all your MRIs, all your blood tests, your genetic testing, everything they're going to do, your CAT scans. Um, my first appointment with the doctor at the ENT, the first thing they do is they stick a scope up your nose, you know, they numb your nose and they give you this medical cocaine, which is just like, woo, you wouldn't even care if they stuck. And when they put that camera up my nose, it was like that long. And when I, you know, I didn't feel it. I was just like, weird. I was like on a whole different dimension after that stuff she sprayed up my nose. Um, so they they check up your nose. They make sure that, you know, and she was like, your, 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 na your nasal sinuses are clear. I don't see any polyps. I don't see anything that would uh, lead to sinusitis. And that's where the trail begins, where they start checking out your brain and doing blood tests to see uh, what's going on. You know, they also check the fluid for multiple sclerosis. They ch check it for autoimmune disease, Marfan's, polycystic kidney disease, EDS, all kinds of different connective tissue disorders. Um, that's where I'm at right now. I have an appointment on the 16th. I will keep you posted. I have to go in for three uh, MRIs with uh, contrast for different, uh, different parts of the brain. Um, and then on the 16th, I will sit down with my doctor and we will see from there where we are going. Obviously, we are going to get patched, but we want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Because I am also, also we're in a, a support group on Facebook. It's the uh, Cerebral Spinal Fluid Leak. Um, you can put that in on Facebook. Uh, there's... 2,000 members to that. Most of them are spinal leakers, people who have the problem where they have to get the, the blood patches through their spine because they had some kind of a trauma or an epidural or a, a lumbar, lumbar puncture that left them leaking. Uh, there is a sister group, which I belong to. There's only about 190 members. You see how how even less it is. Our, our bigger group has 200. It's a sister group for cranial leakers. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you just ask one of the admins to go ahead and connect you in. And there's so much support and information and different doctors that you can go to that are recommended that are specialists in this because you will need a specialist, a skull-based ENT, a neurosurgeon. It depends on exactly where your leak is at. Um, and spinal and cranial leaks are totally separate things, totally different kind of surgeries. Uh, you could get a blood patch 
through the spine, which is where they take out blood from your own arm and inject it into your spinal fluid, trying to cause blood clots in those holes to patch that up. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. People in my group have gone through it 10 times. Some people have gone through it three times. Some people are lucky and on the first time they caught it. Um, cranial leaks is a little bit different because of connective tissue disorder. It can cause the skull to erode. The base of the skull will erode. So it becomes porous. It's like, like when you get osteoporosis in your bones, it's spider webbed. So, um, if they patch up one leak and they don't fix the actual problem of the intracranial hypertension, or if you have a tumor and they don't take care of that, or if you have a bone spur that is poking into the dura mater, or if your brain is sagging, when you're, when you're losing the liquid and you're on low pressure, your brain starts to sag and it can go through the holes and it starts to herniate in the holes of where you're leaking the fluid from. So, and you know, you get a pull down, you could like, you lose your sight too. Um, so they really take a long time before they, they fix this because they want to make sure that when they fix it, that you're not going to spring a leak somewhere else, which has been very common. A lot of people in my group have had the cranial surgery two or three, some 10 times. And it's because they never address the original factor. Usually by the third surgery, the doctors are um, it, installing either a, a stent or a shunt because that just means that your brain cannot handle the pressure um, and you need a release. So they would install a shunt or, or um, a stent. Usually if you get a stent, they wind up giving you a shunt later on, but they do it in increments because it's a major surgery for you to have a tube going from your brain and it goes down, you know, and it, and it, it you'll, you'll, it'll leak it out from the bottom. So, um, that's where we're at right now. Sorry, this video was kind of long, but people who are in this same situation, this video is for you. This video is, um, to help you uh, get help for yourself. Um, invest in buying yourself a blood pressure monitor because in the beginning when, you're, when your brain's ready to blow, your blood pressure is going crazy and nobody can figure out why. And they want to put you on blood medication, on blood pressure medication and everything, which is great. A diuretic is great, but they put me on a diuretic a month before and my brain still blew. So Keep a journal, get a journal, write it down, take your blood pressure every day, take your note the time when it goes up. Mine always would go up between two or three in the morning. You'd wake up because that's the time when your 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 choroid plexus is reproducing more fluid. Um, stock up on the uh, tissue. You can get these little rolls. I don't know, you know. I've been leaking so long now that I just use tissue and you know, like everybody comes over and they give me a box. That's just, that's my gift. Um, I will keep you posted. I want you to keep your chin up and your smile on because even though you're leaking, it's not the end of the world. You're still here. Okay. It could have been something a lot worse. You're still here. Um, and you're here for a purpose and you need to take care of yourself and this is a time where you're going to have to really get a network of support and friends and family to come in and help you and you have to let yourself do because you need to rest you cannot be walking around with your brain leaking out until you get your surgery and after your surgery the recovery period is is a long time you know it could be anywhere from three to six months where you're just flat out be prepared to leave your job or to try to work from home. I had to leave my job when I first started getting this the end of October because I could not physically stand up anymore. I was getting edema in my legs where it was just swelling up like elephants. That's another sign that you get that your body just has too much pressure, too much liquid in there. Um, 
take care of yourself. Drink lots of fluid. Eat healthy. Drink organic juices. Um, chicken soup. Stay away from stress. When you go out, put a mask on. You do not want to get meningitis. You that, that is your main goal is to avoid yourself getting physically sick, a cold, even if you have kids. My my children, when I when they're sick, I got this on because I'm not going to be in the hospital connected to machines with meningitis. And neither should you be. Take care of yourself. Love yourself. Give yourself the rest. Um, and we'll get through this. I'll keep, I'll keep you guys posted on my, um, my next date when I go to the doctor and tell you what's going on with that, what was said, and, uh, we'll go from there. You guys have a blessed day. I love you. Take care of yourself. Get help. Do the glucose testing. If you got some liquid and nobody's believing you and they think you're crazy, you can take the you could take that test it in front of them and google it from the national library of medicine and show them how how uh cerebral spinal fluid has glucose and mucus does not so as long as it's clear and there's no trace of blood and you can do from your finger and your nose and they're not the same level you got it if it's only 10 or less coming out of your nose it's not cerebral spinal fluid if it's between 50 or above, it is. Okay? I love you, my loves. Take care, and God bless.